Okay, we're ready to get going. We're going to start. And as we picking up, we did an overview of the book of Revelation last week. Today, we're going to do introductory material to the book of Revelation. And so it was written uh, from an island, a Greek island called Patmos. And he, we see in Revelation 1, 9, he says, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now we know that uh, he was put there uh, because uh, all the apostles had died before AD 70, except for John. And so this is AD 95 or so when he is there, when he is writing it. And so you see he's writing to the seven churches in Asia. Asia is uh, the west coast of Turkey. And these are the famous seven churches. And so the island there is right there in Patmos, and I've been there, it's about nine miles long, and it has 365 churches on it, one for every day of the year. And uh, it's got a main sanctuary, uh, main area that the Greek Orthodox run, and uh, they built that uh, around the year 400, a monastery uh, to venerate uh, the Apostle John. And as you come in, that was our boat coming into that little uh, bay area. And uh, there's a village there today, and we rode on the Patmos Express going over there. And here is an area where uh, very near a cave that they believe the Apostle John uh, lived in, perhaps. Uh, and stuff, and it's also a speaking area. Tim LaHaye and I uh, led a tour there years ago, and uh, so Holy Cave of the Apocalypse, and I was on the island of Patmos, as it says there in John, and there's the monastery that's there, and uh, it, we'll be talking about the date of the book of Revelation, and none of them, I went there and spent some time talking to some of the monks and they had never heard of the early date of the book of Revelation, AD 65, which is, you'll find out here in a minute uh, more about that. They had only knew of the AD 95 date, which is interesting. And uh, so we see in verse 11, it says, write in a book, literally scroll, uh, what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And that's not in Pennsylvania, for some of you that might uh, think so. I just guess it's probably named after the Philadelphia in the Bible, wouldn't you? Well, so you, you see, this is what the Lord is telling John to do, to write in a book and send it to these seven churches. And so it's believed that the seven churches were a postal route back in the day, starting with Ephesus, which was the primary city. And it goes up in this fashion, kind of a circle or a half circle, Philadelphia, and then down to Laodicea. And you can see Laodicea is not far from Colossae, where the book of Colossians was written too, as well. And this part of Asia, as it's called, was, would be very similar to the United States. It was one of the most prosperous areas in the world at the time. And uh, it was a significant area. And so there's the circuit, so, as it was called. And here you have uh, an example of how some people today view uh, the book of Revelation 2,000 years later. This is Lawrence O'Donnell on March 22, 2011 on MSNBC. The book of Revelation is a work of fiction describing how a truly vicious God would bring about the end of the world. Now, no half-smart religious person believes the book of Revelation anymore. Those people are certain 
that their God would never turn into a malicious torturer and mass murderer beyond Hitler's wildest dreams. Well, I usually have to play that a couple of times <laughs> to, to uh, people to absorb that. But you can see this is a contemporary view that the smart people of the world uh, know more than God or smarter than God. And so we see that Book of Revelation focus, I think, is on judgment. That is the focus of the Book of Revelation. Now, John wrote the book of Revelation because the book of Revelation says he wrote it. The revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's, it's a revelation from Jesus, which God gave him to show to his bond servants, that would be believers as a whole, the things which must shortly are better translated quickly take place. In other words, when they start taking place, it's going to be sudden. And he sent and com uh, communicated it to his angel, uh, by his angel, to his bondservant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. And so we see, uh, he, he sees uh, the book of Revelation, and he says like 44 times, I, and I saw, and he's reporting. So he's not free to talk about uh, you know, just anything that he wants to talk about is it, revealing this. Now, there are four basic approaches to when the book of Revelation will be fulfilled. And we're talking about the, uh, not the seven churches or any of that, but from chapter four onward. And so there's four ways that you can relate to time, past, present, future, and timeless or atemporal. In other words, it doesn't relate to time. And guess what? Those are the four interpretive approaches. Uh, and a lot of people don't realize this about the book of Revelation, that historically there's been these four different approaches, especially if you read commentaries and things, it's good to know some of this stuff. And so there is preterism, and that's the Latin word for past or gone by, preter, preterist. Uh, we have the gr uh, grammatical term uh, preter, preterist. And they believe that the book of Revelation was fulfilled uh, before A.D. 70, in the, in the judgments of A.D. 70, although there's three levels of preterism. Some believe part of the book of Revelation was fulfilled in A.D. 70, and others was fulfilled uh, like uh, with the, the uh, destruction of uh, Rome you know, and stuff. So, but it means the past. And so there's extreme preterism that believes the entire book was filled in AD 70. And this is a view that developed in the 1800s. And you'll see some churches of Christ uh, hold the preter, this full preterist view that, and if that's true, then that means we're in not the millennium, but the new heavens and new earth. It's kind of a letdown, isn't it? But that's uh, the view, and of course, they allegorize everything real extremely. And then there's moderate preterism, which uh, is somewhat popular. Uh, people like Hank Hanegraaff, as you'll see here in a moment, uh, Gary DeMar, the Christian Reconstructionist, uh, uh, and a number of people have adopted some form of preterism. Uh, who's the Christian counselor guy? Um, Jay Adams, thank you. And uh, we're going to see here in a moment a debate dealing with that. And so preterists believe the book of Revelation is, uh, as I heard a Church of Christ minister one time on the radio said, you can put a fork in it, it's done. So uh, that's a surprise to y'all. So that's past. Present is historicism. Uh, and this has been a very popular view uh, especially in the 1800s, and three of the four major cults in the United States that were founded in the 1800s uh, all hold a historicist view. The Seventh-day Adventists, Mormons, and Jehovah's Witnesses all hold a historicist view, and they believe that the book of Revelation is being fulfilled present throughout the church age, 
And so they believe that the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments are being fulfilled uh, throughout church history. And so they have a very complicated system of certain events. And so historicists believe that the Pope is the Antichrist, successive popes. Uh, the day-year chronology, in other words, the 1,260 days are really 1,260 years. And the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments were fulfilled during European events of the last 2,000 years. And uh, they are into date setting. These are the people that love to date set. That's why Mormonism, for example, is built around it. Seventh-day Adventism is, is known for its multiple dates that Christ is going to return. And of course, they don't believe in the rapture or any of those other kind of things like that. So that's historicism. Uh, futurism is a view we hold. We hold that basically uh, these from chapter four on is future to the church age, to the time in which we live. And therefore, we believe that the New Testament epistles teach the rapture of the church and therefore uh, we'll enter the 70th week of Daniel, which is unfinished. And all of these things from chapter four onward are future to our own day. And they're gonna literally happen. So we, this is an overview here you see of the future events uh, that will happen. And then there is idealism. And it is the fact that there's no timing at all. It's just ideas or concepts. And uh, a lot of so-called scholars hold this view that these are just ideas. Uh, for example, someone may take Revelation 1-7 about Christ returning and say, he returns every day in many ways over and over again. You know, this kind of this allegorical type of stuff. And so a lot of commentaries uh, today are from the idealist perspective. And they look down upon anybody who thinks that they can know or understand the book of Revelation. So we had a debate in the year 2007 between Hank Hennegraaff of the Bible Answer Man and Mark Hitchcock, uh, who wrote his doctoral dissertation at Dallas Seminary on the date of the book of Revelation. And uh, there's a guy named Ken Gentry who wrote his arguing for the early date. You'll, you'll understand all this here in a moment. And uh, we could, he, he refused to debate, interestingly enough. And so we ended up getting Hank Hennegraaff, who was probably the least qualified of the people that we wanted, but he was the only one that would accept this debate. And it was in Dallas in December of 2007, and John Ankerberg came and videoed it. So uh, there is Mark. And I'm going to now show the first section of Mark's thing. Where is that back here? Nope. Here, nope. Here, here it is. Okay, great. and we'll have some more tomorrow. But tonight, we're going to enjoy the debate. By the way, when we started this group, we had 31 people here in Dallas for our first meeting. Dr. Walford was here, 
Dr. Pentecost, Dr. Charles Ryrie, and a number of other fine scholars, Dr. Toussaint, who's here today. Many of these know the end from the beginning because they're there now, but uh, the rest of us are just waiting in line. But it was said that there weren't enough people interested in prophecy. Today, we've had well over 400 people gathered and it's growing in momentum. And I have a special message I want to give to you to a Dallas Seminary graduate, Dr. David Jeremiah. Dr. Jeremiah was my successor in one of the churches I pastored in San Diego. He knew we invited him to come and he had another commitment. And he said, I've got a message for the delegates to those who say that teaching Bible prophecy is not interesting and not evangelistic, not productive. Tell them that I started a series of 10 prophetic messages and we charted the service attendance one year before and the 10 Sundays of that uh, series. And we had an average increase attendance of 700 people. People are interested in the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it's my privilege to ask you to bow with me as we thank the Lord who is coming for the opportunity. Heavenly Father, as we bow before you, we thank you that you not only sent your son to save us, to die for us, and to prove his, your acceptance of his sacrifice, you raised him from the dead. Thank you for the gift of salvation. And the things that we agree on here in this meeting tonight is that God so loved the world that he gave his son that whosoever believeth on him should have everlasting life. And we thank you for the privilege of preaching it and teaching it. And we pray that Jesus, our coming Lord, will be glorified in all that we say and do. In his name we pray. Amen. And now may I introduce to you the executive director and the man really responsible for the success of this ministry, Dr. Thomas Ice. Because of the futurism versus preterism interchange, and futurism is the belief that those who uh, interpret the book of Revelation chapters four and following believe it, that the tribulation, the second coming and the millennium is future to our own time, whereas preterists uh, believe that all or parts of the book of Revelation were fulfilled in the first century. Uh, the date of the book of Revelation is very important. Also, because this year's theme at the pre-trip study group is the book of Revelation, we thought it was important to deal with the date of the book of Revelation. If the traditional late date of about AD 95 is the correct view, then it renders all forms of the preterist interpretation of the book of Revelation impossible because Revelation is said to be a prophecy of the future and not a prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem and the Jewish temple by the Romans in AD 70. However, for the futurist, it does not matter when Revelation was given by the Lord to the Apostle John, since even now, most of its events are futuristic, even to our own day. Therefore, the early date is essential for the preterist position of Revelation to even be considered a possibility. This is why, if it can be demonstrated that the late date is true, then it eliminates the preterist view of Revelation as a possibility. Hank Hanegraaff will advocate and defend a pre-80-70 date of Revelation, while Mark Hitchcock uh, will contend for the AD-95 debate date. Hank Hanegraaff serves as president and chairman of the board of the North Carolina-based Christian Research Institute International. He is also host of the Bible Answer Man radio program which is the broadcast daily across the United States and Canada, as well as around the world through the internet. Anagraf is author of The Prayer of Jesus, Christianity in Crisis, and Resurrection. He also has written, uh, is co-author of a novel called The Fuse of Armageddon, 
and a Last Disciple fiction trilogy called The Last Disciple, The Last Sacrifice, and the forthcoming The Last Temple. Hanegraaff is a regular contributor to Christian Research Journal and The Plain Truth Magazine. He lives with his wife, Kathy, in North Carolina and are the parents of nine children, as well as five grandchildren. Mark Hitchcock has a BS degree from Oklahoma State University, a law degree from Oklahoma City University School of Law, practiced law for four years at the Oklahoma Court and Criminal Appeals. He felt called into the ministry and received a THM from Dallas Theological Seminary and recently completed his PhD at Dallas. Uh, he's pastor of Faith Bible Church in Edmond, Oklahoma. He's been there for 16 years. He's also adjunct professor of Bible exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary. He is the author of 17 books uh, related to end times prophecy. And he's married to Cheryl and has two sons there in Edmond, Oklahoma. We asked Hank if he wanted to go first in the debate, and he decided he would go last. Therefore, Mark Hitchcock is going to go first, and Hank will end the debate. And so, without further delay, uh, we'll ask Mark Hitchcock to come and give his opening 30-minute presentation. Before we get started, I wanted to uh, thank uh, Tim LaHaye and uh, thank Tommy Ice and the Pre-Trip Study Group for uh, hosting this debate. And I want to thank all of you for coming out on a cold, dreary night uh, to be a special part of this event here this evening. And I, I want to especially thank Mr. Hanegraaff for taking time out of his uh, busy schedule uh, to come into uh, the dispensational lion's den, if you will. You know, it's dispensational. It's like the book of Daniel. So for this debate, um, a debate that I pray can be used uh, by the Lord uh, to help us uh, further the understanding for the body of Christ um, of the book of Revelation. So thank you very much for, for coming and for participating in this uh, debate with us. There are two main dates for uh, the composition of the book of Revelation. There is the Neronic date, written during the time of Nero, or the early date, uh, about AD 65, and the Domitianic date, the late date that it was written in AD 95 uh, during the reign of Domitian who ruled from uh, 81 AD to 96 AD. This is uh, the traditional date of the church uh, for the last 1900 years. Now, Tommy's already mentioned this briefly, but why is the date of Revelation so important? I mean, his book, The Last Sacrifice, Mr. Hanegraaff says, much has been made of the differences in the interpretation of Scripture applied by the Last Disciple series and the Left Behind series. One of the key distinctions between the end-time theologies called eschatologies employed by these two series has to do with when the writing of the New Testament was completed. The Last Disciple series is based on an interpretation of Scripture that holds the entire New Testament was completed prior to the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, in contrast, the Left Behind series is based on the assumption that Revelation was written in A.D. 95, long after Jerusalem's destruction. And I did note here that Mr. Hanegraaff states that his view is based on interpretation of Scripture and, and our view is based on an assumption. Um, also in the Apocalypse Code, Mr. Hanegraaff says, For LaHaye, everything hinges on proving that the book of Revelation was written long after the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70. If, like the rest of Scripture, Revelation was written prior to A.D. 70, his entire left-behind juggernaut is compromised. Now, these statements really are not accurate. They leave the false impression that Mr. Hanegraaff's view and futurism are both dependent on a particular date for the composition of Revelation. However, the only one of the four major views of Revelation that is date-dependent is preterism or partial preterism. If Revelation was written in A.D. 65, Futurism is still a viable uh, interpretive option. However, if Revelation was written after A.D. 70, then Revelation 1 through 19 cannot be a prophecy about the events of A.D. 70, as Mr. Hanegraaff believes. R.C. Sproul, in his book, The Last Days According to Jesus, says if the book was written after A.D. 70, talking about the book of Revelation, then its contents manifestly do not refer to events surrounding uh, the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, partial preterist Ken Gentry 
says if the late date of around AD 95-96 is accepted, a wholly different situation would prevail. The events in the mid and late 60s of the first century would be excluded as possible fulfillments. Mr. Hanegraaff is correct that his view is totally dependent on the AD 65 date. He has hitched his entire eschatological wagon to the AD 65 date. However, he is incorrect in saying that futurism is based on the assumption that Revelation was written in AD 95. Futurism is not based on any particular date of Revelation. We would just simply believe the Apostle John wrote it. It has to be written after the seven churches uh, came into existence. It is true that most futurists hold the AD 95 date, but this is simply because they or we believe it is the correct date, not because the view itself is dependent on that date. One consequence, though, of the traditional AD 95 date or any date after AD 70 is that this is fatal to preterism or the idea that Revelation 1 through 19, that those events were fulfilled in the first century. Uh, Francis Gumerlach says futurists, on the other hand, generally believe that the book of Revelation contains prophecies, the majority of which will be fulfilled near the end of the world. While the date of Revelation is not crucial to their interpretation of the book, it is important in their polemic against preterism. And uh, Richard Mayhew, who's a member of our pre-trib study group, says uh, significantly a futurist would not have to change his eschatological thinking if a pre-AD 70 date for the writing were to be established. However, the preterist position is eliminated from consideration if the late date of AD 95 could be validated. If Mr. Hanegraaff is correct about the date of Revelation, the futuristic view of Revelation can still be true. There are futurists who hold the early date of Revelation, uh, such as Zane Hodges. If Revelation was written in AD 95, then Mr. Hanegraaff's view of Revelation 1 through 19 never even gets off the ground. Revelation cannot be prophesying events about Nero and the fall of Jerusalem if it was written after those events occurred. Mr. Hanegraaff's entire eschatological scheme then hangs precariously on the mid-60s date of Revelation. Any date after AD 70, or really any date after June of AD 68, because he believes it was written during Nero's reign and he died in June of AD 68, then that's fatal to his view. And this is the essential problem for Mr. Hanegraaff's position. He's constructed his entire eschatological framework on a point, the AD 65 date of Revelation, that at best is improbable and at worst is untenable. That is why he has to defend the mid-60s date so vigorously and can't give an inch. If he does, his entire view falls apart. Now, what about the burden of proof in this debate? Early date advocates, I believe, have the burden of proof since the AD 95 date is the accepted traditional date. Partial preterist R.C. Sproul admits the burden for preterists then is to demonstrate the revelation was written before AD 70. Now, there are two lines of evidence for dating New Testament books. There's external evidence, evidence from outside the book, and then internal evidence, evidence from inside the book itself. And we want to consider both of those in dating uh, the book of Revelation is really that we do with all other New Testament books. Now, the main arguments for the AD 65 date uh, that are presented, uh, Mr. Hanegraaff in his book, The Last Sacrifice, says, in summary, from all the reasons we are well justified in believing that the book of Revelation was not written 25 years after the destruction of Jerusalem, three tower above the rest. So Mr. Hanegraaff develops what he calls three towers from the internal evidence for the AD 65 date. His first argument is that if Revelation was written in 95 AD, that it's inconceivable that John would not have mentioned the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. The second tower is there's no mention of the fulfillment of Jesus's prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem in Matthew 25. And he also believes it would be inconceivable for, for John not to mention the fulfillment of this prophecy. Now you notice these first two arguments are arguments from silence. And the third argument, the third tower, is that John mentions the Jewish temple is intact when he writes. So since the temple's mentioned, he believes it has to be the, uh, the, 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 the temple that was destroyed in AD 70, so John has to have written before that time. Now here's the answers to the first tower, that there's no mention of the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 in Revelation. Uh, two answers to this. First, the audience for Revelation was Gentile believers in Asia Minor in AD 95. The destruction of the temple was a Jewish event 800 miles away and 25 years in the past. 
It was remote from the original audience, ethnically, geographically, and historically. Second, Revelation is not a history. It is a prophecy. The book begins by telling us it's a prophecy, and at the end, these are like bookend statements for the book. The book of Revelation deals with the future, not the past. John was taken in a vision to the future and told repeatedly to write down what he saw. The words, and I saw, occur about 44 times in the book of Revelation. The destruction of Jerusalem, an event 25 years in the past, was not part of the vision of the future that he received. Now, Revelation 119 is key to this because you remember that John is instructed by Jesus himself, write therefore the things you've seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. If John is writing in AD 95, he is not at liberty to write about the past because he is commanded by the risen, glorified Christ himself, write what you've just seen, write the things that are presently, and write the things that are future. If John had written about something that was past in AD 95, he would have been disobeying the direct command uh, from Jesus Christ himself to write about the present and to write about the future. That's why there's no mention of the destruction of Jerusalem in uh, the book of Revelation. Now, the second tower is there's no mention of the fulfillment of Jesus's prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem. Mr. Hanegraaff says, as the student of the New Testament well knows, New Testament writers were quick to highlight fulfilled prophecy. The phrase, this was to fulfill what was spoken of by the prophets, permeates the pages of Scripture. and demonstrates conclusively that the Bible is divine rather than human in origin. Thus, it is inconceivable that Jesus would make an apocalyptic prophecy concerning the destruction of Jerusalem and the Jewish temple, and that John would fail to mention that the prophecy was fulfilled one generation later, just as Jesus predicted it. The problem that I see with Mr. Hanegraaff's statement here is that the book of Revelation never does this with any prophecy. Revelation does not contain the formula, this was to fulfill what was spoken of by the prophet. Not one time. There are hundreds of allusions to Old Testament prophecies in the book of Revelation, but there's no, there are no fulfillment formulas in the book of Revelation for any other prophecy. So why would we expect it to be there for this one? The answer to the third tower that John mentions the Jewish temple is intact at the time he wrote. It is true that John mentions a temple in Revelation 11, 1 and 2, but this does not mean it had to be standing at the time he wrote. Daniel in Daniel 9 that was written in 538 BC and Ezekiel 40 through 43, which was written in 573 BC, both of these men mention literal temples that were not standing at the time they wrote. Daniel 9, Ezekiel 40 to 43. John followed this same familiar Old Testament pattern and described an end-time temple. Mr. Hanegraaff says that Revelation is a virtual recapitulation of Ezekiel. Now, if that's true, and if Ezekiel, writing 13 years after the temple was destroyed, talks about a future temple, why wouldn't we expect John to do the very same thing if the book of Revelation is a recapitulation of the book of Ezekiel. So there's Old Testament precedent for this from the book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel, these books that, that uh, John uh, relied upon so heavily in uh, writing the apocalypse. So these are Mr. Hanegraaff's three towers for the AD 65 date. Now, a couple of other internal arguments for the AD 65 date. I know we'll talk about these in more detail, but Mr. Hanegraaff points out how the words soon and near are used in the book of Revelation. And his view of these terms is that they mean that the events that are prophesied had to happen within a few years of the time uh, that the revelation was given. The problem I see with that is, is the strategic location of these timing terms. Notice the word soon is the word tacos. It's used in chapter 1, verse 1, then at the very end of the book as well. And the word ingus, so near at hand, is used in chapter 1, verse 3, then again at the end. So these terms serve as bookends or like an inclusio for all the material in the book of Revelation. So whatever meaning you give to these terms must account for all the material in the book. The problem that I see the inconsistency in Mr. Hanegraaff's interpretation is he takes Revelation 1 through 19 as having been fulfilled in a few years after he believes Revelation was written in 65 AD. Yet in Revelation 20, he still sees a future second coming, the great white throne judgment, and the new heaven and the new earth, which obviously those things didn't happen soon or near, according to his definition. 
everything in the book has to happen within whatever definition we give of soon and near. My understanding of those terms is they speak of imminency, that these are events that could break in upon the world at any time. Because John in, in 1 John 2 says, little children, it is the last hour. This time we live in, this age is the last hour. These age are the, these, this age is the last days. And so these events are soon or near or at hand. That is, they could break in upon the world any time. Really, if you're going to be consistent and take these uh, terms and, and, and be consistent with soon and near, you either have to be a futurist or you have to be a full preterist. You really can't be a partial preterist and uh, maintain consistency. One other argument that I, I'm sure we'll talk about probably uh, some more here a little bit later is that Nero is the beast of Revelation 13. It's maintained uh, that uh, in, in the Hebrew language, that if you take the word Neron Caesar and convert that to the gematria value, the numerical value, that that does equal 666. The problems with this view are that Nero was never associated with the beast of Revelation 13 until at least the 5th century. And really not a lot until the 1830s by uh, four uh, German preterists. The early church consistently applied Revelation 13 to a future final Antichrist. Irenaeus, Andreas, Victorinus, Primatius. The second thing is you have to use the name Nero and the title Caesar to get 666. Revelation 13 says the number of his name will be 666. It's going outside the text of scripture. Also, you have to use a defect, what I believe is a defective spelling. Also, you have to use Hebrew, the, the language of the audience John's writing to is Greek. You have to use a Hebrew uh, name or title that would have not been familiar to most of the audience. But really, the strongest argument is simply that Nero did not fulfill the prophecies of Revelation 13. Who was the second beast who gives honor to the first beast? Never heard that satisfactorily answered uh, by preterists. What about the image that comes to life? What about the, the karagma or the mark on the right hand to buy or to sell? If you're going to take the number 666 literally in this passage, you have to take the other things in the passage literally as well. And they simply don't fit what we know about the life and the reign of Nero. Now, what's the external evidence for the traditional AD 95 date of Revelation? The first witness for the late date is Hegesippus. Um, writing in A.D. 150. He was born about 15 years after the book of Revelation was written. He wrote his memoirs, which are five uh, treatises that he wrote. Hegesippus is one of the key sources that Eusebius, we'll talk about him in a few minutes, the father of church history, used to formulate his opinion that John was banished to Patmos under the emperor Domitian, who was the Roman emperor from A.D. 81 to 96. So this is the first witness about 55 years after the book of Revelation uh, was written. Exhibit A for the late date is Irenaeus. Irenaeus was born in about 120 AD. He was the Bishop of Lyon in southern France. He was born and raised in Smyrna, which is one of the cities that the book of the Revelation was, was uh, addressed to, written to. He was discipled by Polycarp, who in turn, Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John. And Irenaeus wrote against heresies in A.D. about 170 or 180. Now this is the statement of Irenaeus. When he's talking here about 666 and the Antichrist, he says, we will not, however, incur the risk of pronouncing positively as to the name of the Antichrist. For if it were necessary that his name should be distinctly revealed in this present time, it would have been announced by him who beheld the apocalyptic vision for that that is, the apocalyptic vision was seen no very long time since, but almost in our own day, towards the end of Domitian's reign. Writing in 170 AD, Irenaeus, who grew up in Smyrna, who knew Polycarp, who knew the Apostle John, says that the apocalyptic vision was seen towards the end of Domitian's reign. And Domitian's reign ended in 96 AD. Now, there's three objections to the testimony of Irenaeus. Objection number one is that Irenaeus was ambiguous. Mr. Hanegraaff says, first, it is instructive to note that the late dating for Revelation is largely dependent on a single and markedly ambiguous sentence in the writings of Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyon. 
This sentence can be taken to mean that either John or that John's apocalyptic vision was seen toward the end of Domitian's reign. Now, there's two answers to this objection. First of all, the statement simply is not ambiguous. The apocalyptic vision is the nearest antecedent, for that was seen no very long time since, but almost in our own day towards the end of Domitian's reign. And let's be honest, if this statement said at the end of Nero's reign, Mr. Hanegraaff would be using it as a slam dunk for his view. Secondly, the first person we know of to suggest that this statement was ambiguous was Johann Jacob Wettstein, a German preterist in 1752. No Greek speaker for 1,650 years ever questioned that this statement referred to when John saw the apocalyptic vision. J. Ritchie Smith, writing in 1888, said, it is a sufficient answer to all these forced interpretations that the early church always understood the words of Irenaeus and their plain and obvious meaning, nor would any other have been suggested if his testimony had not been a stumbling block in the way of modern exposition. Number two is that Irenaeus was mistaken. Mr. Hanegraaff loves to point out how Irenaeus made one error in his writings concerning the chronology of Jesus' ministry. Irenaeus said that Jesus lived to be almost 50 years old and his ministry spanned a period of almost 15 years. That was an interpretive error that, that I agree Irenaeus was mistaken there from John chapter 8, where you know, Jesus said, you know, I've seen Abraham. They say, how'd you see Abraham's day? You're not even 50 years old. So based on that passage, he made an interpretive error. But it's a lot different to make an interpretive error about a passage than it is to be wrong about a historical fact. The date of Revelation is a historical fact. By the way, uh, who here hasn't made an uh, interpretive error in the Bible? <laughs> you know, all, of, all of his writings, this is the only error I've ever seen pointed to that Irenaeus made. And it's an interpretation, not about a historical fact that was commuted, commuted to him by Polycarp. No one was in a better position to know the date of Revelation than Irenaeus. Irenaeus was also very specific about the date of Revelation. He narrowed it down to a period at the end of the reign of Domitian. This gives even more credibility and confidence to his testimony. Philip Schaff, in his classic work, History of the Christian Church, says, Irenaeus is the leading representative of Catholic Christianity in the last quarter of the second century, the champion of orthodoxy against Gnostic heresy. He united a learned Greek education and philosophical penetration with practical wisdom and moderation. He is neither very original nor brilliant, but eminently sound and judicious. His position gives him additional weight, for he is linked by two long lives, that of his teacher and grand teacher to the fountainhead of Christianity. A third objection is that Irenaeus simply parroted other people after him. The problem here is that you can't have it both ways. If Irenaeus was so ambiguous and even mistaken about the date of Revelation, why did everybody follow him? Moreover, while it is true that Irenaeus is a key source for the dating of Revelation, many key historical facts can be traced to a single source. Every tradition has a beginning point. This is inherent in the nature of historical evidence. And what more reliable source could we have than Irenaeus, uh, who knew Polycarp and grew up in Smyrna? Um, Origen said the king of the Romans, as tradition teaches, condemned John, who bore testimony on account of the word of truth to the Isle of Patmos. The only tradition we know about is the tradition from Irenaeus. Origen can be counted. Victorinus was the author of the earliest known Latin commentary on Revelation, the first great exegete of the Western church. As a commentator on Revelation, we can assume that he took a great interest in when the book was written. When John said these things, he was on the island of Patmos, condemned to the labor of the mines by Caesar Domitian. There, therefore, he saw the apocalypse. The time must be understood in which the written apocalypse was published, since then reigned Caesar Domitian. A Eusebius, the father of church history, who sat at the right hand of Constantine at the Council of Nicaea. He says, but after Domitian had reigned 15 years and Nervus succeeded to the empire, it was at this time that the apostle John returned from his banishment in the island took up his abode in Ephesus, according to an ancient Christian tradition. And I won't read uh, the other quote by him. Uh, Jerome is uh, the one who translated the Bible into Latin. Jerome, and against Jovinianum, wrote that John was a prophet, for he saw on the island of Patmos, to which he'd been banished by the emperor Domitian as a martyr for the Lord, an apocalypse containing boundless mysteries of the future. Lives of illustrious men. He says the same thing. 
Mr. Hanegraaff, remember, says the late dating of Revelation is largely dependent on a single and markedly ambiguous sentence in the writings of Irenaeus. Is this really true? And what is the external evidence for the AD 95 date? I want to put this side by side so you can see it. On the AD 95 side, you have Agesippus, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Origen, Dio Cassius, Victorinus, Eusebius, Jerome, Sulpicius Severus, Paulus Erosius, Primacius, who writes the second uh, Latin commentary on the book of Revelation that we still have. The first witness for the AD 65 date is a superscription, one line superscription, and a Syriac version of the New Testament in 508. And then again in 616. And then Arethus in 850. And then finally a man named Theophylact in 1100. That's the external evidence uh, for the book of Revelation. The late date has an overwhelming line of support from some of the greatest, most reliable names in church history. These witnesses come from different and widespread geographical regions of the church. And I'm not going to uh, read these quotes by, by different men here. One stubborn question remains for Mr. Hanegraaff and other early date advocates. If the AD 65 date for Revelation is correct, this means it had a running 30-year head start on the late date. If this were true, why was it not the overwhelming view of the early church? Why did it take 400 years for it to appear? The early date would have enjoyed every advantage to establish itself as the accepted date by the church fathers. Yet the opposite is true. The AD 95 date became the accepted dominant date from the middle of the second century until the 21st century. Why is that? Because it is the date when Revelation was written by John on the island of Patmos. Let me just hasten here to some of the internal evidence for the AD 95 date. According to church tradition, John did not even come to Asia until the middle to the late AD 60s, according to F.F. Bruce in New Testament history which would not have allowed John time to settle in Asia, replace Paul as the leader of the Asian churches, and then be exiled to Patmos before Nero's death. A second argument I have is there's no mention of Paul or his work in Asia in the letters to the seven churches. If Revelation was written in the mid-60s, there would have been an overlap of Paul's letters, first and second Timothy, which were written in the mid-60s to the church at Ephesus at the same time Revelation was being written there. Yet John makes no mention of Paul. Paul makes no mention of John. John makes no mention, or Paul makes no mention of the uh, Nicolaitan heir that's spoken of in the book of Revelation. You have these letters crisscrossing or overlapping at the same place. Uh, the absence of any mention of Paul by John is inexplicable, I believe. Also, a third argument is the severe spiritual decline of five of the seven churches would require an extended period of time, not a few years. Ephesus has lost its first love. Pergamum has Nicolaitan error. Thyatira has fallen into the deep things of Satan. Sardis, the church of Sardis, is dead. Laodicea is so rich and arrogant, the Lord wants to vomit them out of his mouth. Now, these churches were founded primarily during Paul's third missionary journey in the mid to late 50s. So within 10 years, less than 10 years, five of the seven churches are so bad that the Lord's going to come remove their lampstands. This fits the AD 95 date much better. I mean, if it had just been one or two churches, maybe you could say, yeah, in that short a period of time, but five of them are in this condition. It suits a time much later than 65 AD. Number four, the, uh, Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, said that the church of Smyrna did not even exist at the time of Paul's ministry. Yet Revelation 2, 8 through 11, indicates the church had been suffering persecution for some time when John wrote to them. Uh, number five, and I'll talk about this more later, Laodicea suffered a devastating earthquake in A.D. 60. The rebuilding of the city spanned a period of 30 years. Yet in the Laodicean letter, it says they're rich, they don't have need of anything, and yet in 65 AD, they were just in the first years of a building program that would span a period of about 30 years. Number six, Revelation 1.9 says that John was exiled to the island of Patmos when he received the apocalypse. There's no evidence that Nero banished Christians as Christians, yet we know that Domitian banished Flavia Domitilla to an island for her faith in Christ in AD 95, the same year. Also, why would Nero execute Paul and Peter and yet banish John? The different sentences for Paul and Peter and for John argue for different emperors. 
Finally, one last argument. Revelation 2.13 says that Antipas of Pergamum was martyred for his faith in Christ. Tradition records that Antipas was roasted alive in AD 92 in a brazen shaped bull altar. In a brazen bull shaped altar. Obviously, Revelation had to be written after this event took place. So the AD 65 date, the external evidence is no clear support until AD 508, 400 years after Revelation was written. The internal evidence are Mr. Hanegraaff's three towers, two of which are arguments from silence. On the other hand, the AD 95 date, the external evidence is a solid line of support beginning in AD 50 from the luminaries of the early church. Men that Mr. Hanegraaff, as we're going to see later in the debate, actually relies on for other information. The internal evidence is seven arguments that strongly suggest, and in some cases, uh, even require uh, the late date. So Mr. Hanegraaff's first external witness for the date of Revelation is 400 years after Revelation was written. Now to give us a little perspective on that, Jamestown, I think, was founded in 1607. And today it's 2007, it's 400 years. The first witness externally to the Neuronic date, the 65 date of the book of Revelation was 400 years after these events took place. Between that time, you have the luminaries of the early church saying this is when the book was written. So the conclusion that I come to from looking at the external evidence, the internal evidence, is that the traditional AD 95 date stands firm and Mr. Hanegraaff's eschatological scheme falls. Thank you. Well, this was a three hour, this was a three hour and 20 minute debate. <laughs> uh, if you, want to watch it it's on our preacher website you can watch it for free all three hours and 20 minutes if you're interested further and uh, that's www.pre-trib.org and uh, so Hanegraaff gave one argument when he got up and that is uh, in his 30 minutes he got up and quoted the book uh, the first chapter of the book of Revelation for seven minutes. And then he talked about the importance of the date of the book of Revelation to the 23 minute mark. I was the timekeeper, so I knew this. And uh, then he gave his one argument that if the book of Revelation was written after that, it would have talked about the destruction of Jerusalem or something like that. That was his argument. And so they went on back and forth. Uh, you know, on, on these, the rest of this debate. And I bring this up because the book of Revelation is the most documented of all the New Testament books as to when it was written. There's no other book in the New Testament that has more evidence for when it was written than the book of Revelation. And as you see, it's important when it comes to interpreting it. And so we believe that it is a future uh, future, the futurist interpretation is correct, that chapters four and following are future to the church age, and so we will be dealing with this in the days ahead. So I just wanted to orient you to those these issues tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the many blessings you've given us by giving us the book of Revelation, <clears throat> and thank you for these men that have spent time studying these issues out so that we can benefit from them. And we thank you that we anticipate, as we see our own culture and society collapsing, it heightens our anticipation of the fact that you could come at any moment via the rapture of the church and take us to be with you. One moment we're here, the next moment we're gone. And we pray that we would be about your work in the meantime and not use that as just an escape from our problems. And we pray that you'd be with us in the days ahead as we continue to study the book of Revelation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.